Hey guys, welcome back to Pop Daddy. Uh, so I'm very, very, very excited for this interview. I've been wanting to chat to this gentleman for a very long time. He has published books such as, and such as, of course, dun 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 dun. dun. His name is Ian Brody. Hello, good sir. <laughs> good morning or good afternoon for you. How are you? I am good, and yourself. Yeah, very well. It's um, Western Australian autumn, which means it's only going to 30 today. Oh, we've got rain. Uh, so I was just telling everybody how much I've been uh, really looking forward to this interview. You're an amazing, talented individual who's brought out some Thank you. books. You're welcome. Has brought out some books that have impacted my life quite a bit and uh, determined my travel itinerary in many ways. <laughs> Welcome and thank you uh, once again. Why don't you tell us what your upbringing was like? Yeah, I was uh, born and bred in Auckland and uh, lived in Idaho and had a great, it was a very happy upbringing. And uh, mum and dad used to take me away on holidays every summer. And my dad was a great photographer. So I guess from a very early age, I was introduced to uh, what one would consider a short trip somewhere taking all day because we stopped every five minutes for dad to take a photo. <laughs> well, why not? <laughs> New yeah, Zealand's got exactly. so much to offer. Uh, it, from Auckland, uh, all around the North Island. And then in 72, 71, uh, I think we uh, went down to the South Island of New Zealand for the first time. And uh, that coincided with my first reading of Lord of the Rings. I've said before, it was the landscape of the South Island of New Zealand that felt to me like I was in Middle Earth. Hey, uh, so do people recognise you in public? If so, what's that like? No, not anymore, because I live in Perth, so nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> back home? Back home. I haven't been back to New Zealand. I shifted to Australia uh, via England five years ago. Um, so I haven't been back to New Zealand since. But I guess uh, when the Lord of the Rings was at its peak, yes, it was. And it's embarrassing. <laughs> How so? I, I mean, I, I, being an actor, I, I mean, I'd like a little bit of recognition every now and then. Uh, how, what, how did you find it embarrassing? Well, maybe that's not the right word. I'm flattered, but uh, hey, I'm just the same as anybody else. So uh, there's no need for any form of recognition. I just got to do something really cool that um, I enjoyed and had the passion to do it. And I was lucky. I can understand that. I think a lot of New Zealanders, I always get it wrong, either have tall poppy syndrome or don't have tall poppy syndrome. It's one of them, like you do something absolutely amazing. A lot of people really do appreciate it, but we're humble at the same time. We're like, yeah, we did it. Yeah, it was a project. Yep. It was cool. You know, whereas overseas, it's like, I'm an actor. Get away from me, you know? Yeah. Complete different sort of scale. Yes, it is. And um, I'm very proud of what I've done um, and achieved. I have no um, qualms about saying that, and I'm really proud. A lot of other people probably had the chance to do it. Maybe it was my, and it's always been an ambition for me. I have a driving force. If I want to do something, I will do it no matter what. So I just push forward and never take no for an answer. So, of course, you've got your, your authorship, you do photography. What do you sort of get into away from that? Uh, that's my life. Lots of uh, title music um, goes my way. Um, but I'm working um, a lot with enhanced ebooks, and I'm just coming out of completing a 250 page enhanced ebook for UNESCO, which is the story of the Rukan Nautodden. Uh, industrial heritage site in Norway. Uh, Norway's become almost my second home. I've been there now maybe 21 times. I'm normally there at least twice a year. So I have a lot of clients over there with photography, creating websites and writing. Norway and New Zealand is very similar, you know. It's, it's a landscape that's similar and the people are the same. The people are down to earth, very practical and will just go and do things without thinking of um, a lot of the things that could go wrong. They'll just go and do it. And that's fantastic. And my jobs in Norway have always been confirmed with a handshake. There's never a, a contract or anything like that. Uh, you just go and do it and, and away it happens, which is fantastic. So because I get paid for my hobby, I don't consider that I actually work. 
I also read somewhere that you like to fly warbirds. Uh, not fly, uh, take photographs of them. And of course, I was director of the New Zealand Fighter Pilots Museum in Wanaka for 18 years. So that's my real background is, is aviation. I worked prior to that for Air New Zealand uh, for 12 years on computer training uh, for reservation staff and a reservation supervisor. But uh, warbirds was and still is my passion. And uh, of course, involved in Warbirds over Wanaka from its inception in 1988, right through until 2010. So, uh, yep, um, aeroplanes, World War II history, the story of New Zealand fighter pilots is um, something that shaped my life, I guess. Recently got to have a stint as a photographer at Wings over Wairarapa. And nice. um, yeah, I can, I can quite honestly say that it's quite a difficult job trying to get that that right photo when you got planes like you know, it's just, yeah, ah, yeah 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 so, it, it is yeah. um, air to air is much better where you're exactly sitting next to an airplane and they're just moving in space like this it's it's like floating through a uh, water you know people think of air as being nothing you can't see it but you feel it uh, with air pockets but when you're up beside two airplanes it's actually movement it's it's fluid and um, that's where you really uh, see an aeroplane in its true colours. So did you always dream about, uh, you know, creating books and doing photography? Was that always your dream job? Not really. Um, I was going to be a film director when I uh, left school and uh, went to work in a, or wanted to study film and uh, ended up in a travel job in, in Otahu in Auckland um, for the holidays to save up some money to go to university. Enjoyed it so much I stayed there. Went through the travel industry in Auckland. I got shifted to Christchurch and worked um, in a travel agency there. Then joined in New Zealand and stayed with that. But photography was always in the background, taking photos of aeroplanes, uh, taking photos of landscape. And I guess, yeah, it's been part of my life forever. And of course, with your, you know, your recent history and uh, with what you've done and whatnot, you've obviously seen a lot, if not every part of New Zealand. What would be your favourite part of New Zealand? <laughs> How long is a piece of string? Um, <laughs> it depends think, where you cut it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think one of my favourite places is Glenorchy out of Queenstown. Um, I've always liked uh, that place and it was Lord of the Rings that took me there uh, visiting the locations and it's got an atmosphere of feeling about it that is unrivaled anywhere but it's funny absence makes the heart grow fonder they say and that's very true and now um, that I've been away from New Zealand for five years uh, watching anything with New Zealand landscapes and it uh, makes my heart well and that's probably any part of New Zealand so I'll stretch that out and say the whole of New Zealand is cool. So I've got some photography-based questions now because I don't know if you're aware, but I have my own media company and I yep. do photography and video production. So some of those is actually going to help me, but it's also pretty good to add into the interview. Whose work has influenced you the most? When it comes to uh, photography, I actually go to cinematography and look at the works of Stanley Kubrick, um, Antonioni, um, are two that really stick out uh, to me. Photography, I look at people's photographs and go, damn, I wish I was as good as them. I never feel my photographs are as good as what I see in a magazine or, or posted somewhere. I'm my, probably my harshest critic. When it actually comes to influence, I think to hell with it. I just went out and did what I wanted to do. Among your works that you have done, what has been your favourite project and why? I think Lord of the Rings was amazing because of the places I got to visit. But I would also then say probably my most favourite product or, or project was working in Somerset in England for six months. I was contracted to create an advanced, enhanced e-book for Visit Somerset. And um, so Diane, my wife and I spent six months in Somerset based in Wells. And we traveled the length and breadth of that county and I photographed it. It was cool for me in a number of ways because it was England and it's such a beautiful place to photograph. But it was where my grandparents, great grandparents came from. 
So it was returning back to my roots as well. And to spend six months intensively visiting landscapes that are so varied, I think that is up there with some of the best things I've done. So, of course, you would have gone through or potentially gone through a lot of cameras from when you started to today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what camera are you currently using and what was your first ever camera? Yeah, first ever camera, that's easy, was an Instamatic. Remember those, you bought the flashes that sat on top and they had four bulbs in a square and you used them very sparingly, exactly the same as you did with the film. Uh, because you had one shot at it and that was it. That was the first. Uh, currently shooting with a Nikon D850. Um, I've got a Nikon D750 sitting there and uh, also a Nikon Z6, which I am now starting to shoot video. Um, I've uh, had it converted so I can shoot uh, Apple ProRes RAW and I've got a Ninja 5 monitor uh, recorder that I can put on top. So I'm shooting RAW, which is a great way to capture video. But having said that, the Nikon D850 is, I think, the finest camera I've probably ever owned. I've still got my Nikon original SLRs sitting in a drawer. One day, maybe they'll get dragged out as well. <laughs> <laughs> so what would be your favorite subject to photograph? Uh, definitely landscape. I'm okay photographing people, and I enjoy photographing people on a movie set because you are taken into another world. Um, and at the same time, you're working with a whole group of talented uh, people that are creating a scene for you to photograph and they are lighting the scene for you to photograph. So it's like being a fly on the wall of something very special. Unit stills is my favorite along with landscape and that can combine. Um, I worked a couple of years ago on an Australian film here in Western Australia called Rams, uh, starring Michael Cate and Sam Neill, and uh, shot down in Mount Barker, uh, which is a very rural landscape. It reminded me of my old hometown, Lugget, in a lot of ways. But to work there, we were working outside on farms. I got to photograph the likes of Michael Caton, who was a hero of mine from the Sullivan's days. And of course, Sam Neill, I'd be photographing him and then I'd turn the other way and photograph landscape. And the same applies. I worked on a Norwegian film called Beekerbeiner, uh, which um, starred amongst people that I guess you would know as Christopher Hivew, who played Tormund Giantsbane in Game of Thrones. And uh, so I worked for six weeks in the uh, mountains of Norway uh, as unit stills, uh, up into minus 25, minus 35. Uh, degrees and you'd be I remember uh, one day standing in a snowstorm photographing two of the actors with literally minus 30 wind chill clothed up but photographing and then I turned around and looked at the landscape that was behind me that was equally as cool um, just absolutely fantastic so that's the best of both worlds so what is involved in your post-production? Uh, I'm a Lightroom boy. I always have been. And I initially go straight in, uh, back up the roars. I, I never sleep at night until I've got two backups done. You know, I just, I'm always nervous. I've only ever had one card fail on me. And that was in England, in Somerset, photographing the Red Arrows and a Vulcan over Western Supermare Beach. Card failed, nothing managed through a um, software recovery program that cost me $200. And I think they charge you that because they know you're desperate, got them back. Lightroom is definitely my uh, go-to program. Finish it in, I'm starting to use Luminar 4. I'm, I'm really liking Luminar product. Um, it's very clever and it has some interesting little uh, things that uh, make it very worthwhile. So. Luminar 4 combined with Lightroom are probably the two uh, major programs I use now. Yeah, Lightroom's really good, especially when you're doing bulk images. You know, I, I used to do my bulk photos in Photoshop, one photo at a time. Mm -hmm. And oh my goodness, I was there for hours. Now you just import the whole lot into Photoshop, uh, into Lightroom. You work out which ones you want to flag as rejected, and then you start working on yep. the good ones. It's a lot quicker. Yeah. It's great. You know? It is. Yeah. No, I agree. To anybody who's out there using Photoshop, stop it. Lightroom. Yeah, definitely. It's the only way to go. 
And I do a lot of drone work as well. I first bought a drone back. It was a Phantom 1, I guess. And all it was was a drone and you mounted a GoPro underneath it. And off you went and you couldn't see what you were taking. Um, you just flew around and hoped for the best. I've got a Phantom 4 Pro sitting in Norway that I use over there all the time. And a uh, Mavic Pro here in Australia. And I do a lot of panorama type shots with that. I enjoy that as well. It's fun. If my mate Tim was to hear this, he'd probably be patting you on the back with the Mavic Pro. Good good choice. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> yeah, it's um, funny. I looked at the Mavic Pro 2, the newer one. And yeah, it's great, but I'm waiting for the three now. And uh, DJI, annoyingly, are not uh, releasing it yet. So I'll just stick to the original. <laughs> I, I'm amazed at where these drones can go. I've used the Phantom 4 and the Mavic before that in Norway up in extreme blizzard conditions almost and minus 25 degrees. And they just keep on going. I've had a couple of issues I never fly in fog in Norway because it's invariably freezing. The blades ice up, so you've got to be very careful there. But um, I've put those DJI drones in, in a number of places that I never thought I'd see them again. It's the same with Nikon. I've never had a Nikon fail me. And um, the coldest I've been is minus 38 up in the mountains, and it's worked like a charm. So what does photography mean to you? Uh, it's a means of outlet and expression try to share with people what I see more than anything else. And that's why I guess when you asked before about influences, you know, of course there's everybody influences a photographer, but uh, my main aim is to uh, graphically show somebody else what I think is cool, what I enjoy in a landscape and what I saw and experienced at the time when I took that photo. Kind of like, putting someone else in your shoes to experience what you experienced at that moment yeah. in time. For someone like me who wants to ideally long-term get into film and TV stills, what would be one bit of advice that you'd give to somebody? You've got to learn to work on set and learn the protocols of working on a set. That's the first thing you should learn is know your place. And on a lot of film sets, the stills photographer is probably the lowest of the low <laughs> uh, because they're making a movie a and a stills photographer is the last thing on their mind. But I always approach it with the same old good old Kiwi handshake and here I am and this is what I do. I always become friends with the DOP and the focus puller and that team and the sound guys and always hang out with them and always be mindful of what you're doing that you're not impinging on their space because they are the ones that have got the job to do. I enjoyed working. Uh, I just did a couple of episodes um, of a series called Itch here in Australia. It's a um, teenage market children's mini series, uh, season two, and in very confined spaces in a professor's laboratory, for example. The crew was so good, and there was a couple of scenes I just had to get. If you're friends with the first AD and say, look, I'm going to get out of your way now. There's no room in here, but can you give me five minutes at the end to get what I want? And they appreciate that. You go and sit, and you have a, I have a coffee and a steam, and I sit outside listening. And when I go, yep, that's done, then I just am there, go right let me get my two minutes worth and that's the thing uh, you've also got to be very aware of and be set to do is to go you can't take 10 minutes to focus you can't take five minutes for this because you're holding up a production that is rolling so you've got to be ready to get what you want immediately and get the right shot some good advice thank you yeah, yeah that's fun but it is fun it's a lot of sitting around. It's a lot of doing nothing for some moments of absolute fun and amazement. And to see actors working to be part of the process of art, that's what I enjoy more than anything else. It's almost, I feel like in a lot of instances when I'm doing it, that I should be paying them because <laughs> I'm getting to experience this. And I'd have to say every film I've worked on, they have treated me with the, the crew have treated me with the utmost grace and friendship.
you can't be an arsehole. No, there's no room <laughs> you know, for that. It's no use coming out being an arsehole because yeah. you just won't get anywhere. Exactly, exactly. And then word of mouth and then you just won't have any more work at all. That's know? right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So what's one place you'd like to photograph but you haven't been to yet? Uh, yeah, that's easy, New Mexico. Simple as that. Um, I have a terrible not a terrible, a huge desire to visit New Mexico. I've been to Arizona. I traveled to the States a lot when I was in the museum game. I used to go up to you know, museum conferences at various museums, Arizona, Washington, D.C., Seattle, San Diego. But New Mexico is the home of film. It's the home of desert. And I have to say this, it's the home of Breaking Bad. <laughs> <laughs> All of which, of which are passions of mine. So... Um, at the moment, I'm just biding my time, but all I really want to do is um, go and photograph New Mexico film locations. So New Mexico Film Commission, if you're listening, I'm here, ready to start. <laughs> <laughs> Hire the damn man already. Jeez. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what exactly fascinates you about air shows to create books on them? It's actually the aeroplanes, but I think the main thing was the people that flew them in a wartime situation. And I am of the age that I knew a lot of fighter pilots. There's not many left now from World War II. Uh, but some of them were my closest friends, one in particular um, who passed away five years ago. And to look at him when he was in his 70s, but to imagine him as an 18-year-old in charge of what you consider a multi-million dollar aeroplane now, and charged with going out and killing people, I guess, is, is, is there's no simple way of saying it. Thousands of miles from home, uh, not knowing if you would actually survive the day. And Jack saw some of his best friends die at 21 years of age. It's a time that I don't know if we will ever see again because of the the way technology changes with aeroplanes or has changed. So it was the people, it was the people side of things that um, intrigued me. But the beauty of these aeroplanes at, at the time when the Spitfire came out or was flying in 1940, it was the epitome of design. It was the ultimate flying machine, uh, one of many at that time. But yeah, it's a passion since I was young. So I've been fortunate enough to fly in a number of aeroplanes backseat of Harvards and, and photograph other aeroplanes. And it's something I will never forget, uh, the opportunities to do that. So talking about warbirds, my favourite one is the Avro Anson. Ever, so, yeah. ever since I saw that at Wings Over Wairarapa, I, I fell in love. It was beautiful. But what's your favourite warbird? Uh, I think one that I've never seen fly, and that's a Hawker Tempest, um, a Mark V Hawker Tempest. There is one or two being restored or one being restored at the moment. And it's one I watch with interest. It's owned by an American now called Kermit Weeks based in Florida, but it's an ex RNZAF aircraft, or uh, sorry, I should say, it's an X 486 New Zealand squadron that was part of the RAF flown by Kiwis. Oh, wow. So that's something very special. But I think I have to say a Hawker Hurricane um, after that, followed by Spitfire, the list goes on. But <laughs> It does. <laughs> it really does. Yeah. yeah. The Tempest 5 is um, something that I just want to see flying one day. Yeah. We'll slowly now gradually go into the, uh, the, the, the main reason we've got this interview is, of course, the Lord of the Rings location guidebooks. Uh, sure. My first question into that, though, is what went into planning of your Middle Earth Landscapes book? I think it was your latest one that you've released from Middle Earth. Yes, and funnily enough, that was the book that I wanted to actually, that's it, produce first. And it was just finding a combination of the best of the best, I guess, of the places I loved. And I was totally um, single-minded in that, that I wanted to showcase the best places that New Zealand is now indelibly marked as Middle Earth, and it always will be. So to show those places to people whether they're fans or not, it doesn't really matter because it's it's such a special landscape that New Zealand offers. Location guidebook time, we're focusing on it, the pinnacle of some existence, I suppose. How on 
earth did you get involved with such a masterpiece? It's funny, and it always comes back to the one thing, and that's passion. Uh, and as I think I said before, I first read Lord of the Rings in 72. So I always thought of New Zealand as Middle Earth and had, uh, by the time filming started on Lord of the Rings, I probably read the book 40 times. So I was a geek um, by far. Well, I thought I was a geek until the books came out and the film. And then I realised I just have a passing interest compared to some. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very uh, true. <laughs> because I'd always thought New Zealand was Middle Earth, it just seemed obvious to me that this film was being made with a whole lot of locations that were in New Zealand and it was going to be Middle Earth. Somebody needs to record that so people can go and visit and see New Zealand as Middle Earth like I had when I'd read the books, you know, over the previous number of years. So that was the idea. And I had published my Warbirds book, so I went to read publishing in that time and said, hey, this is what I want to do. And they said, well, I'm sorry, you can't because it's part of um, the Tolkien estate. It's Upper Collins. That's their baby. So I went, that's fine, well, I'll write to them. I wrote to Harper Collins, and about eight weeks later, I got a letter back saying, we think this is a great idea for a little book about New Zealand and its landscapes. And although all the books for The Lord of the Rings have been um, allocated, they're only allowed to release so many titles, uh, 15 from memory, we are prepared to put this in as book 15A. So... Yes, just you can do got it. There. <laughs> just got there. So that was just before the Fellowship of the Ring had come out. It was then a matter of planning and getting down to it. I flew up to Auckland, met the publishers and talked with them. And my editor, who remained one of my best friends, I met her for the first time. She was a Lord of the Rings fan as well. So it made it very easy. And it was then that I had to make contact with the crew and was uh, put in touch with another very good friend of mine, still to this day, Claire Raskin, who uh, was the unit publicist. Because the book was official, I guess, it was a good start. So I was then, um, went to Wellington. Uh, I remember the first phone call from Claire saying, hi, Ian, let's keep in touch and come and see me in Wellington and, and let's see what we can do here bubbly enthusiasm uh, made just made my day. So I flew to Wellington, met Claire, and sat in three foot six in the buildings uh, where Lord of the Rings was being made. And one of the first people that came in and was introduced to me was somebody that I recognised straight away, and it was Barry Osborne, the producer. And I think... Claire wanted me to meet him to make sure that he thought I was okay, that I was going to do a good job. I haven't spoken to him for a long time, but he was, the, uh, along with Claire, Barry and Claire were the two that got the book rolling for me. So uh, their enthusiasm for that book meant it became what it was. If it wasn't for them, it wouldn't have been. So Claire shared with me all the locations, and of course I then had to go and visit them. Uh, which was such a shame. <laughs> Damn it. <sighs> so, yeah, somebody has to do it. So I literally uh, packaged up the family and we did a New Zealand road trip. Uh, myself, uh, my wife, two children, and um, away we went. And, of course, everybody that uh, involved in a location that was going to maybe or was public or could be public had signed all these non-disclosures and, they were very unwilling and quite shy to talk about it. So the first thing I had to do was get an official letter that said, hey, this guy's okay, you can talk to him. Because they were scared. They just didn't want to do a thing. So that's where it started. And I literally went, uh, anecdotes, got stories, found all the places, went there. Uh, Claire shared with me all the call sheets so I could read between and just see what was filmed there. Covered that off and then... I, at that stage, it was um, a totally different situation, non-digital. So I had to fly up to New Line in LA and go to the studios or their offices in Hollywood and literally go through all the slides that had been taken by the unit stills photographer, Pierre Vinay, who's unfortunately no longer with us. He passed away maybe eight or nine years ago, but... 
uh, all his slides. And I sat there for five days looking at slides through a light box, choosing the ones that matched where I'd been. And the interest was there. I could see that. And at that stage, I threw my war birds and, and talking to media. I ended up talking to a friend of mine or a guy that had interviewed me, Hamish Clark, who worked uh, for Holmes, which used to be on every night at seven o'clock, and said, hey, I'm doing this book. It's really cool. Um, I'll see if you can come with me and we can talk about it. And Harper Collins said, yep, you can do that, but it's not allowed to come out until the night before the, the book is released. So Hamish Clark and I had some great adventures up in Nelson with Bill Reed, um, who flew us into Mount Olympus and Mount Owen. Bill Reed, who incidentally restored and flies the Anson that you love so much. So it's a small world and oh. in, in aeroplanes. Uh, Bill Reed, whose father was a pilot with 486 New Zealand Squadron flying Tempest Fives with my great mate, Jack Stafford. So <laughs> it was full circle. We did Dark River Safaris. We did Nomad Safaris in Queenstown. We flew with Bill. We flew with Halliworks with Alfie Spate, who was the main camera helicopter pilot for Peter for Lord of the Rings. And that was that. The book went through the editing process, all the other things. And it was to be launched in Queenstown. I um, asked uh, Destination Queenstown if I could launch it in Queenstown. They said, yes, we think that's a great idea. David Kennedy was the CEO of Destination Queenstown at that stage. So the launch was the night before the release and we stopped the speeches at seven o'clock at the launch so we could watch the Holmes piece. And also tonight, the Tolkien fan who's realised a dream. And I still remember sitting there watching it and Hamish and the editing team did such a good job. It's still on YouTube in a very ratty version, but you can find it on YouTube. And I'd remembered saying to Lorraine, my editor, how many books do you think we'll sell? And she said, well, we've printed 18,500 copies and we think that will last a year, which amazed me because the Warbeards books were good sellers at 6,000 copies, 7,000 copies. The book came out on the Friday. On Monday, they were reprinting and away it went. It was just unbelievable. It was like the book became number one in New Zealand, stayed as number one in New Zealand for, I think, about 40 weeks. It was one of the longest at number one books in New Zealand uh, of all time. And now there's about six different releases, including the Hobbit ones. Is that right? Yes, there is. There's six different releases. The Lord of the Rings is still the best seller. It's up to maybe 600,000 copies sold now, or up until a year ago when COVID struck. Your last one for the Lord of the Rings one was this one, right? Yes, that was. We updated it because so much had changed and it was still selling. And it does, well, it hasn't sold in the last year. Um, I wonder why. I wonder why, yeah. <laughs> but that'll happen again. I did use your location guidebook when my fiance and I went on holiday last June and I managed to go and see Weathertop, Port Waikato. Uh, nice. Managed to go to the, I think it's a Rangitiki River, one of four or yes. five rivers used for the River Anjuan. I went to, is it Mangafeto Falls for Gollum's Pool? Yep. 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 Uh, so went Great there start. and around Ruapehu kind of ways as well. Um, but yeah, no, your book was helpful, especially when you got the coordinates, you know, um, E, you know, that, that, that fancy kind of gibberish. Check that into Google Maps and boom, you're away laughing. So if you haven't got the and book yet, was, get it. Yeah, yeah, no, and it's still at Amazon. That was the funny thing. The book wasn't written for longevity. And when I first wrote it, um, some places I'd say, it's a paddock here somewhere, but look for the red painted fence on the side of the road because the fence is gone now and a lot of instances trees have gone so the revised edition i had to take all those sort of pertinent references out but i think mine was the first book to have gps coordinates and i had a proper garmin gps um, that i walked around with and, and got the coordinates so that's how um, you did it yep uh, no such thing as phones in those days that yeah, could tell you where true. you were. That's true. I suppose you've kind of answered this. What did you hope to achieve when making these books? 
to share my love of Tolkien in New Zealand. So looking back on the popularity of, of the books and its impact on tourism in New Zealand, is there anything you would have done differently in your research or publication? I don't think so. It was done to the best of my ability at the time. And that was a time of pre-cell phones and pre-digital and pre-everything like that. So it was a true guidebook, I guess. I would have had better maps in it, uh, one thing I would have done. And I wanted better maps. And my publisher said, no, 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 no. People buy an atlas if they want that, which is quite true. Eh, I'd rather it all in one book. <laughs> I'm working now um, with a company in the States called Set Jetters. That's an app that is film locations worldwide. We're having a lot of fun with that. So I'll, I'll give a little plug, setjetters.com. That's something we'll be developing over a period of time because that's my next step is I'm a geek. I love computers. I love everything like that. Is with set jetters, we'll have everything in the palm of your hand on a phone. So for those that don't, aren't up with the latest technology or like the good old physical thing, is there going to be a re-edition of the Lord of the Rings or the Hobbit location guidebook at some point with better maps and stuff? Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> no, it's I couldn't possibly say. <laughs> well, definitely buy one. Hands up. Definitely. Excellent. Uh, so obviously, you know, you, you were saying your publisher had this X amount of copies of the book the night before the uh, the premiere and whatnot. Obviously, here you are thinking, yeah, okay, that's that's quite a lot. That'll last a year. Clearly, it didn't. It lasted, what, two, three days. Yeah. Were you aware at the time of the impact your book may have? No, not at all. As I said, it was something I always did just to showcase my love of New Zealand and Tolkien. I remember I made contact with... Uh, Tourism New Zealand when I uh, received the contract and spoke to a lady called Jane Dent who was a reporter for TVNZ in a previous life and as she said to me afterwards she said I could have reached down the phone and hugged you because that was something that we knew New Zealand needed um, so for uh, the Return of the King uh, premiere in Wellington I became the spokesperson really for Tourism New Zealand on all things Lord of the Rings, uh, which was fun. I talked to so many media, I just lost count, um, and big media uh, from New York, Sky News in London, it just went on. Um, so I got to be able to share my passion with the world. Uh, so is there anything in particular about the contents in your book that deserves more attention from its readers? That's a very difficult question. <laughs> no. Not uh, that I can think of. Uh, so we see that you won two awards from Booksellers New Zealand, both a platinum and a gold winner for your Lord of the Rings location guidebook. How did that feel? Yeah, that was that's like a pop star getting a golden disc, isn't it? It was just made me so proud for what I'd achieved, again, for Tolkien and New Zealand. And it was the same when I became a, a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit. You know, I got this letter in the mail from the governor general and i thought what's what's this and i opened it up and it was a letter saying um, you've been nominated to receive uh then become a member of the new zealand order of merit for your services to writing and tourism of course in england it's like an mbe essentially that was probably one of the proudest moments of my life to receive that um, and just out in my office here i've got and it's become quite poignant just in the last week um i've got the Guess you call it a certificate, the record of it with Elizabeth R signed at the top. And that's something that I'll treasure forever is to be honoured by your country and the Queen and the Governor General. And that way is something I never thought would happen. So before we finish up, if there are other huge N Brody fans out there like myself, where can people sort of visit your social network EY? Yeah, I'm everywhere. I'm Ian Brody Photo on Facebook uh, and on Instagram. Uh, my website, ianbrody.net, and I've also got another one, ianbrodyphoto.net, which is where I just dump photos. I've got thousands of them up there. Uh, but ianbrody.net is probably the best place. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, I never update it as often as I should, but I'm there. <laughs> Photographers don't seem to update as much as they should, right? <laughs> Too busy I doing agree. everything else. Exactly. Uh, so what's the next thing that people can see uh, coming from yourself? Uh, it's funny. I'm actually embarking on a trip in a month's time uh, for Screen West here in Western Australia. And I'm out 
travelling around a huge chunk of Western Australia, down south to Esperance uh, and across to um, sort of that whole goldfields um, area to look for film locations or photograph places in Western Australia that could be used in film. And it's a job open at the moment uh, for somebody to come with me and I'll be mentoring them, which is kind of cool. I get to share my passion with somebody that maybe wants to learn location photos or unit stills um, and what I do. So we're going to drive around a whole lot of different places in Australia and Western Australia and photograph them, which will be cool. Are applicants still open? They are. You've got to live... (laughs) And the Esperance Kalgoorlie area, that's all. (laughs) (laughs) No, that's all good. Uh, Well, thank you very much uh, once again, Ian, for uh, chatting with us. It's been great. And definitely go and check him out. If you see him in Western Australia, tap him on the shoulder and, hi! Um, He's definitely a, a decent gentleman to catch up with. So, yes, thank you once again. My pleasure. Nice talking to you. Thanks.